Hello, and thank you for watching this presentation, Bigfoot Best Evidence. I'm Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the community relations team at the Deschutes Public Library. Every month we explore a theme through our programming and this month's theme is mystery. And it's safe to say Bigfoot falls within that category. Our presenter is Cliff Barrickman, Bigfoot specialist and cryptozoologist. Cliff has been doing Bigfoot field research since 1994, going on expeditions in 46 states and five continents. He was an evidence analyst on Animal Planet's TV show, Finding Bigfoot, among work on other documentaries. And he and his wife own and are curators of the North American Bigfoot Center in Boring, Oregon, which features the largest public collection of Bigfoot evidence in the Pacific Northwest. Thank you so much, Cliff, for sharing the best evidence available for Sasquatch as a real species. Thank you very much for having me. I love opportunities like this to speak to people um, in sort of an educational format about Sasquatches because uh, Sasquatches are in fact real animals. I mean, I've seen one myself. They are real. They conform to all the biological rules um, and paradigms that we now know of other species. There's nothing all that extraordinary about them except that they're large and have somehow remained um, not discovered, shall we say. Although I think there's a strong argument that the discovery process process is currently underway. So um, let's jump right into the presentation because I, I hear a lot of um, people who just aren't, aren't familiar with the evidence um, or aren't Bigfoot or, or Bigfoot nerds like myself of saying, well, well, where's the evidence? How come we don't have this? Where the, how, why don't people see them? All sorts of why this, why that, which is reasonable, of course, because the we live in an age of um, misinformation and there's so much garbage out there on television and YouTube and, and everywhere, podcasts. There's just so much misinformation about Sasquatches in particular. So I, I feel it's my job as an educator to uh, put the good stuff out. So let me uh, share my screen here and I will start my presentation. So there we go. The name of this uh, presentation is Bigfoot the evidence. Because again, people are not aware of the evidence and there's so much evidence and it is internally congruent and almost predictable in some ways of what would be expected of a species like this. So let's first start off by talking about the difference between evidence and proof. Okay. Um, basically, uh, evidence is something that kind of supports what you think, you know, like the scientific process, which we'll get into in a minute, um, is, a, is a series of steps and evidence supports your hypothesis, which we'll talk about in a minute, whereas proof is the end all be all that is it there is no other way around it this is proof. And for us, the evidence comes in all sorts of forms, and that's what we'll be speaking about today, but proof, no matter how you cut it will essentially end up being a dead Sasquatch. Now, some other evidence might lead to that. For example, DNA evidence. If uh, some species like Homo Denisovans were discovered solely through DNA. Um, Homo Denisovan, if you didn't know, is, a, is an extinct human relative. Um, and they were discovered solely through DNA analysis. Turns out we had a bone or two, but we misidentified those. And it turns out they're Homo Denisovans. Um, but still, that led to more parts of the body being um, discovered later. In Sasquatches, if we do get good DNA evidence, and we're working on that now, but if we do get good DNA evidence, that's not going to prove it to anybody beyond the DNA experts. Then the scientists will go out and get a dead one. I don't advocate for that. I'm not a hunter. I don't shoot even deer. Um, and certainly shooting probably what our closest living relative on the planet uh, would be an upsetting thing for me. So I'm not going to go do that. I'm not a gun guy. I've got a couple of farms, but I'm no means a gun guy. I live in Oregon. I know some gun guys. I'm not one of them. Um, so that's not going to be me. I'm just going to educate the public and hope it in hopes to soften the blow of discovery. But I mentioned the science that science is a process. And here are the steps of science. Um, science isn't this body of knowledge that's guarded by academics in these ivory towers trying to mislead us and sway political agendas and stuff. That's not what science is. Politicians sway political agendas, not scientists. Real scientists, they start, they, they ask questions. That's essentially what they do. They ask questions and then they try to answer their question. That answer is a hypothesis. Okay. And then, then what they do is they go out and gather evidence to see if the evidence supports their hypothesis or not. Does the evidence say that my answer is right? If the answer is yes, they try to go out and gather even more evidence to, to continue doing that. But if the answer is no, then what they do is they go back and they change their answer. They change their hypothesis. And then they gather more evidence to see if that answer is right. 
That's what science is. Really, science at the end of the day is kind of like a verb. It's something you do. So to really boil it down, scientists, even amateur scientists like myself, are always trying to prove yourself wrong. And if you can prove yourself wrong, that's a victory. And you get to learn something else. And you get to change your answer, change your model, and try to go gather more evidence to see if you can still prove yourself wrong. If you, if you can't prove yourself wrong, then maybe you're right. But you always continue trying to prove yourself wrong. So let's apply this to the Sasquatch stuff. And we're going to do, we're going to do that by starting with some facts. I have four points here. And all of these are indisputable facts. They're, these are not opinions in any way. The first one, um, for more than 400 years, people have reported seeing large, hair-covered, man-like animals in the wilderness areas of North America. This is true. There are historical accounts. Of these. This is a true statement. Now, mind you, the word in there that makes it true is have reported seeing large, hair-covered, man-like animals. I didn't say they saw them. I, I, this fact is they have said they saw them. Maybe they're lying, maybe they're hallucinating, that doesn't matter. The fact here is that people have reported them. The second bullet point says, sightings of these animals continue today. Real or not, these reports are often made by people, people of unimpeachable character. Okay, today, today is a Wednesday, uh, what is it, Thursday, Monday, someone saw one of these things. I was on an investigation all day long on Monday. Five o'clock in the morning, a gentleman was driving up Highway 26 right past the Tollgate campground and saw one on the side of the road. I went out there, spent four or five hours out there. It is a fact that people still report seeing these things today. Okay, Monday isn't today. I get it. Sue me. You, you get the idea. Bullet, bullet point number three. For over 70 years, people have been finding, photographing, and casting sets of very large human-shaped tracks. Most are discovered by chance in remote areas. These tracks continue to be found to this day. Okay, I found tracks on Monday. It's not today, but you get the idea. This is a fact that people report finding these things. People are casting these. People are photographing them. This is a fact. And the last one, the cultural histories of many, I'm going to change that to all, Native American and First Nations people include stories and beliefs about non-human quote unquote, people of the wild. Many of these descriptions bear a striking resemblance to the hairy man-like creatures reported today. Yeah, every native tribe, every indigenous group in North America that lives in suitable habitat has stories of giant hair-covered people-like thing, things living in the woods outside of town. You know, that's a fact. So being an amateur scientist, we're going to ask questions about this. What in the world's going on? What could be behind these facts that I'm faced with? In my hypothesis, my answer to that is that there is a real biological animal responsible. So we're going to go gather evidence now. And there's all sorts of evidence we could take a look at. Now, mind you, none of these are proof. None of these are going to put the nail in the coffin, so to speak, which is probably not the right thing to say, considering I already told you a dead one is going to be necessary. But you get this a figure of speech. So native accounts, historical and settler accounts, contemporary witnesses, sound recordings, photographs, these are all things that like a biologist would be looking for essentially. And that's, way, that's the way the subject should be treated. Sasquatches are not UFO riding, shape-shifting interdimensional things. They are a perfectly normal biological species. They leave footprints, they poop, they shed hair, they, do, they eat, they do things that every other biological thing does. And so we need to approach this from a biological manner and see if we can gather evidence Let's start chronologically. Let's start with the Native Americans and First Nations account accounts. Well, it turns out, I already said this, that pretty much, er, I'm going to say every Native group, every Indigenous group in North America that lives in suitable habitat has stories of these things. And you can go back into historical record of various sorts, whether it's their oral tradition or whether it's photographs from the early anthropologists interacting with the Indigenous people and find evidence. On the left there is a photo by Edward Curtis um, from 1914 um, of, of Hammy, essentially is a Coscomo uh, um, traditional belief of Hammy, which is the uh, 
it's like Zonica. We're going to talk a lot about Zonica in a minute. Um, a giant hair covered biped with very large hands. You see the mouth on that thing. It's kind of in a circular shape. That's uh, because it's imitating the sounds that it makes. And also in some traditions, it whistles and Sasquatches whistle. I have recordings of it. In fact, orangutans whistle. So it shouldn't be that surprising. Um, heck, cougars whistle. You can look it up on YouTube. There's a wonderful um, clip of one whistling. I mean, they're not whistling songs, they're whistling for other reasons. But yeah, look at it. It's upright, it's covered in hair, it's uh, large, uh, big hands. Very, very interesting. In the center there, oh, by the way, 1914, that photograph to the left, that's uh, about 10 or 15 years before the word Sasquatch was invented. In the middle is a photograph of a large mask. It's very large. It's about a foot and a half wide, in fact. Um, I took that photograph. Um, it is from the tribe that gave us the word Sasquatch uh, up in British Columbia, the Sahelis group. Um, and that animal, that, 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 that mask there it depicts Sasquatch. Um, on, the on the right here, on the bottom of that totem pole is Zonaqua. Uh, the photograph's from 1968. Obviously, the totem pole's much before that. This right here is the hairy man pictograph. Um, it's, it's a little hard to see, so I did this. I, I sh showed you like the black line master. Um, on the right there, I'll, I'll just keep this one up, I think. On the right there is a life-size depiction of a hairy man. Over to the left, the other black line master there is the female. And if you can see it, just at the left of the female is a small red figure that is supposedly a juvenile. I didn't have a black line master to put over it, but you can see it with your own eyes. Um, that is eight and a half feet tall. It is called Hairy Man by the Thule Indians who live down on the reservation in the Southern Sierra Nevada mountains. And this is kind of a rare circumstance because there's archeological evidence, this, this pictograph, which is essentially dyes painted on a rock, life-size depicting a frame of their creation story. These particular uh, people, the, the, these indigenous people, are the only group that we know of that have Sasquatches as part of their creation story. I will tell you a very abbreviated version of the story. Um, back in the day, Harry Man was talking to Coyote. And if you know anything about native traditions, Coyote is always the trickster. He's always up to something. You know, he's got a card up his sleeve. So Hairy Man's talking to Coyote about how they should create the other animals. Coyote's saying, you know, we should create them walking on four legs like me. And then Hairy Man says, well, no, I think they should walk on two legs like me. And they were kind of going back and forth about it. They decided to settle their dispute with a foot race, a running race. And so they get ready, get ready, get set, go. And then they run. And of course, Coyote, being, <coughs> excuse me, Coyote being Coyote, cheats. That's what Coyotes do. They cheat. Uh, he's the trickster figure in their, in their traditions. So um, Coyote wins the race, which is why all the other animals walk on four legs. Well, Hairy Man, being the smartest of the animals, finds this out. He figures it out pretty quick and starts crying. And in fact, you can even see the tears coming from Hairy Man's eyes. Hairy man is crying, um, and out of hairy man's tears, human beings are born. That's why we walk on two legs, not four. And then afterwards, hairy man was so bent out of shape and hurt about it that he decided to uh, leave uh, the, the area where he was living and go up into the mountains and live amongst the redwoods and only come out at night. And uh, which is interesting because there's a little glimpse into the Sasquatch um, natural history, their behaviors, they are largely nocturnal, they do live in heavily forested areas, uh, particularly up there amongst the redwoods and that sort of wet climate. So it's interesting that a lot of these native traditional stories can give us a little bit of information about the natural histories of the animals themselves. Um, just so you know, these particular uh, pictographs, the, the sh showing a life-size eight and a half foot tall hairy man, um, archaeologists have narrowed down the date. These were uh, painted on the wall somewhere between 800 years ago to 1,500 years ago. Well, and do the math. You know, white people didn't show up on this continent until about 500 years ago. Where did the native people learn about this Bigfoot thing if it isn't a real animal? if it isn't already out there as part of their environment. Skeptics have to explain that away, that somehow or another, the native people in uh, California were talking to the native people in Florida who were talking to the native people up in the Northern Territories of Canada and all conspiring, describing the same hallucinatory fake animal. Why, how, that doesn't make sense unless it's a real biological animal. And I think that's some evidence that points to that.
Then we move on to the early historical and settler accounts. Um, this dude here with the, I can't tell if that's a cool throat beard or a weird collar, but either way, um, uh, his, 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 he was a guy working, he was a Christian missionary working with the Spokane in, uh, Indians. His, his name is Elkanah Walker. Um, he was out there kind of towards Spokane, that general area, and he was looking at these mountains over to the west. We're not sure if he's looking at Mount Adams or Mount St. Helens, really, or maybe even Mount Rainier, but one of the big mountains that you can see from, you know, 300 miles away. Um, and he said, hey, take me there. And the Native people he was working with said, no, we don't go there, and I'm going to take you there. So why not? And they told him, oh, there's a race of giants that live there that work and hunt at night, and they steal men, and their tracks or footprints are a foot and a half long. 18 inches long. They steal salmon, eat it raw, and they've got a small, uh, strong stink to them, and they whistle and they throw stones. Um, wow, those are all perfectly normal behaviors that have been reported in other ape species as well. And they're also things that you can discern from reading sighting reports of Sasquatches. They've been seen doing all of these things at one point or another, as far as the behaviors go, whistling and throwing rocks and about 10 or 15% of the sighting reports have a smell associated with it, which is interesting because gorillas also have a smell associated with them sometimes under stressful situations. Um, their armpits smell, and it's not like human armpits. Human armpits smell because we have bacteria building up and with the sweat and stuff, and that's what stinks. But gorillas are different. They have a gland in their armpit that they exude this sort of musky, stinky smell when they're under, under stress, like in an um, uh, antagonistic situation or when they're frightened or that sort of thing, um, territorial. And it could be that Sasquatches have this as well. We need to look at the other ape species to learn about what Sasquatches may or may not be able to do. But anyway, um, Elkanah Walker here heard all about Sasquatches. They didn't have a word for it back in 1840, probably called them wild men or something or giants, but uh, they were certainly describing Sasquatches. Teddy Roosevelt actually wrote about a Sasquatch in 1893. His book, The Wilderness Hunter, included a, a story in it told by a gentleman named Bauman, who he described as a grizzled old woodsman. And basically Bauman went into this uh, narrow valley where there had been like a, a group of um, uh, trappers had been killed the year before, but Bauman didn't believe it. He doesn't believe in all hobgoblins and spooky things in the woods. So he and his friends went in there and they didn't, they didn't all come out. Bauman came out and told about seeing a large looming upright figure that left huge tracks that stank pretty bad. And uh, whatever this thing was after they shot at it, ended up killing his two partners. I guess the lesson here is don't shoot at Sasquatches. And some of you are saying the lesson is don't go into canyons where people were found dead the year before. That's probably a pretty good lesson to take away too. But nonetheless, even Teddy Roosevelt wrote about these things. He, again, he didn't call them Sasquatches. The word wasn't even invented yet. The word Bigfoot was still decades and decades in the future. But he wrote about a large, hairy, upright thing that fits the description of Sasquatches. And of course, you can go back into the, um, uh, the, the historical record in the form of newspaper articles and read about them there as well. In this case, this story comes from uh, Bangor, Maine, um, back in 1838, August 4th. So that they encountered a strange animal that looked like a small child, but it was completely covered in hair. And it ran off with great speed, whistling. Hmm. Sounds like an animal I know. Here's one from Pennsylvania from 1878. This, uh, this time it wasn't like a small child, like in Maine, it was a giant, six and a half feet tall, huge broad shoulders, long apish arms with a smooth face, which I'm taking is probably meaning not covered in hair. Um, the funnel shaped head, hmm. could that be des uh, describing a sagittal crest that pointed sort of uh, head shape to the gorilla and other uh, ape species. Um, the body was covered completely with dark brown hair, about two inches long. It pounded itself on the chest, uh, didn't, couldn't talk, and it ran fast and made a bed of leaves and all that sort of stuff. 1878, I want to point out that uh, the, the gorilla was discovered in about 1851, give or take a couple of years. I can't remember exactly, but 1851. So this is about you know, 20, 25 years after that. So there wasn't really a precedent beyond the gorilla, though, you know, as far as this chest beating and all that stuff. Very interesting. Here's one from Oregon. Uh, this animal was seen while hunting. It wasn't wearing clothes, but it was covered with hair. It was also seen eating raw deer. Um, and then, of course, it ran off when, when they saw it from 1885. Um, there is a strong correlation between Sasquatches and deer. 
um, deer migration routes, for example. Um, you track where deer, mig deer migrate, that's where the Sasquatch reports are. Um, there's a, there's a, they've been seen hunting and killing deer before. And here we are, 1885, there's evidence, not proof, but evidence that Sasquatches uh, have that behavior. And of course, the sighting reports continue. Um, here's some uh, witnesses I've had the pleasure of working with. In the upper left, there's a couple people that uh, saw a Sasquatch from pretty close range up in Alaska. Um, very interesting. They were close enough to notice that the thumb on the hand looked different than ours. And of course, we have hand casts. We'll get to that later. The, um, it, that clearly show that their hands are not like human being hands. They're subtly different. The guy on the right, he's a musician. He was driving back from a job in Montana and saw a Sasquatch run across the highway in front of him. Um, basically on the Continental Divide. Very, very interesting sighting. Um, the bottom right, there's a woman who uh, on Thanksgiving, on the way home from her Thanksgiving dinner, saw one cross the road right in front of her, probably 15, 16 feet away from her. Uh, they both locked eyes. Um, she screamed and it made a noise and ran off into the ditch. And of course, there's, there's Lorraine in the bottom left. She's a charmer. She was wonderful. I love her so much. She saw a Sasquatch very close range. I was looking in a window and then it walked down the driveway and she stopped her car and it walked right in front of her car. She was so wonderful. She was just so kind and, and she spoke like a sailor too, um, which was hilarious to me. And she goes, Cliff, I'll tell you what, it looked right at me. And you know what? It was a boy. So, oh my gosh. Well, yeah, so anatomy can be pre present as well. Um, again, these things are perfectly normal animals and you, we would expect such a thing. Um, there are sound recordings um, of Sasquatches. They make all the sounds that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that other ape species do. And they even chatter, which might be indications of some sort of language, but the, the jury's still out on that one. But there is evidence for that sort of thing. And of course, photographs. There are photographs. Uh, Sasquatches are not blurry, but the problem with um, photographs, like this photograph of a Sasquatch running up the Clackamas River, is that uh, Sasquatches are largely, but not exclusively, nocturnal. And when pictures are taken at night, um, any photographer knows that the shutter stays open longer and thus introduces a lot of blur into the photograph. And this thing, whatever this thing is, I don't, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not on there. I think you can. So I'm going to um, outline this. See the blur here coming down. And it goes in like that. There's a blurry thing coming off here. And if you look very closely, there's a little bit of blur here. There's even blur here, which I, what I'm taking this as is I believe this is the head. The back comes down here. This triangular part is probably the right elbow. It comes down. I think this is the leg. And there's a little bit of the knee there. And that's also an arm. Well, this was taken on a game camera. And I went to the actual site and see these dots, these little knots on the tree right there. These are about six and a half feet off the ground. Upon our, uh, my, my recreation of this animal, actually, I think it's seven foot two, actually. I have to check my notes. But I do remember this, that the top of what I'm interpreting as the head is seven foot, 10 inches off the ground. So again, if this is not a Sasquatch, if this bipedal, I see two legs, if this upright, potentially bipedal figure photographed behind two locked gates where only rangers have the key, if this is not a Sasquatch, the skeptics have to tell me what else it could be. The thing is seven foot, 10 inches tall. I have a whole hour presentation on just the recreation of this particular photograph. But again, if this is not a Sasquatch, skeptics really need to tell me what it could be. Because I met the guy, he's not into Photoshop. He doesn't know anything about it. Um, he was a mechanic, essentially. What could this be? Here's another photograph. This one's from Vermont. Um, this particular picture was taken by a gentleman named Frank. I, I've met Frank. I've been to the site. Frank noticed that his apples were like a tremendous number of apples went missing overnight on his tree. And he figured, well, one was doing that. So he set up a game camera. And within two weeks, he got this peculiar picture. Again, let's talk about what I'm interpreting. I believe that this is the head of a Sasquatch looking down. And you can see the left shoulder with the left arm coming down. That's the arm right here. That'd be the right shoulder. And then this is over here. This is the butt. In fact, you even see hints of the butt crack. The natal cleft is what we call that. Um, right here, 
so that the leg would go down the little the knees kind of obscured but that's what i'm interpreting here and what i, I don't know what these white spots are uh, that's kind of a puzzle maybe it's leaves maybe maybe it's vitiligo you know the disease that uh, um, you lose pigmentation in the skin and then the hair that grows out of that part of the skin maybe that's the situation but look at this there's something else here that's darker in color and to me this almost looks like a hand could this be a juvenile Sasquatch grabbing onto the chest of its mother? I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. I've done recreations of this particular photograph. I have a few member, member, uh, measurements that I think are interesting. For example, the crown of the head to what I'm interpreting as a shoulder is 13 inches in length. It's pretty long. Um, not super big, but pretty long. Intriguing photograph, nonetheless. Not proof by any stretch of the imagination, just some intriguing evidence. Here's another photograph that was taken on a really lousy flip phone. Um, this photograph was taken in uh, New Mexico. And uh, basically this part of New Mexico outside of Farmington, I think it's Fruitland technically, but um, those are two communities are adjacent to one another. They're both on the Navajo reservation around the Four Corners area. And um, in this particular part of the country, there's a lot of poverty. So the Navajo nation has taken it upon themselves to grow crops to kind of distribute to the poor members of the tribe. And um, so they, they've kind of irrigated the upper levels. It's kind of desert in that area. Um, and the Sasquatches there kind of hang out in the riverbeds, essentially. Um, and I've spoken to numerous witnesses in the area, and I'm convinced they're there. But um, they're irrigating the upper levels, the flat air, <coughs> the flat ground to feed the tribe, essentially, you know, doing their part to feed the feed the hungry. So um, and because there's poverty, they have to hire security guards to make sure that nobody steals from them, so, you know, because that happens. Um, a security guard got this. Now, I haven't spoken to the security guard. Uh, my friend Bobo has, but um, I've spoken to the security guard's colleagues and coworkers, several of which had seen Sasquatches on the job. And they told me something funny. They said, oh my gosh, Cliff, we were hired to keep the people out. We don't know what to do about the Bigfoots. So um, this security guard saw the Sasquatch one day. It was walking along the hillside and look, um, it's walking from left to right. It's walking this direction. And you can see it's holding like, what, a 12 foot, log or tree or something what in the world is that about i don't know it's an intriguing picture from a, a native reservation though i think that's really cool because again people tell me there are no photographs but yet here we are there's another photograph the originals on the left and i had to you know photoshop it up a bit on the right to kind of increase the contrast and brightness and all that sort of stuff um a 16 or 17 year old dude a guy named ian gill got this photograph as uh, he was driving out to his grandmother's cabin outside of in, in Vermont again, um, about 1230 at night. He thought somebody in a ghillie suit ran across the road and stopped on the side of the road. And he goes, well, that guy looks weird. So he took out his iPhone 5 and snapped a picture of that. Now, when I first saw it, I was thinking, ah, oh, high school kid, I don't know, man. I think he's, I think he's probably hoaxing, he's probably lying about things. But I went out and did the investigation anyway. And I was pleasantly surprised to find out that this sign is still there. It's a stop sign. The very bottom of the stop sign is seven foot, two inches off the ground. Whatever that is, it's pretty tall and it was covered in hair. I find that intriguing. <clears throat> Excuse me, a little thing in my throat here. Here's some excellent photographs from uh, Silver Star Mountain in Washington. Uh, my friend Randy Chase took these. Um, he went up to the top of Silver Star. He, he loves to hike. He brings a six pack and a cigar and goes up and hikes almost every day after work. In this particular uh, occasion, he went up to the top of Silver Star in the snow. It was in November. And uh, he got to the top and noticed a rock on uh, the other hillside that he'd never noticed before, about 170 yards away. Silver Star Mountain has like two, two mountain peaks and he was on one and this thing was on the other. And he goes, what is that rock? I've never seen that rock before and snapped a picture of it. And then he turned around and looked at Portland, Oregon, because you can see it from up there and took a couple pictures of, of Portland and the Columbia River and then turned back around. And in the meantime, the rock had stood up and that's the picture on the bottom left and then the one on the right. Whatever it was, that rock, you know, quote unquote rock, stood up, turned around and walked down the hillside in the snow off trail into a place where there are no more trails, this total wilderness area. Well, um, one of the things that we do when we're trying to figure out if these mediocre pictures are Sasquatches is we compare them to the Patterson-Gimlin film subject, which is what I did on that frame to the right, because Sasquatches are not human beings. They have very different proportions 
than human beings. Their arms are much longer in proportion to their leg, for example. Their, their shoulders are much, ride much higher on them. Their neck is, is put down in front. They're just different in, in every way, basically. So when we want to see if something that uh, a blobby picture like the one on the right is a Sasquatch, one of the things we can do to shed some light on that is compare the limb proportions to a known Sasquatch, which is the Patterson Gimlin film. By the way, I want to say this now, the Patterson Gimlin film has never been proven a fake. Um, Roger, the guy who filmed it, never admitted on his deathbed that it was fake and said, in fact, he did the opposite. He said that, um, you know, I know people are going to look into my character. This like a real film couldn't have been, couldn't have happened to a worse person like me. Um, everything about the film holds up to scrutiny. So all those things you've heard and stuff on the news are kind of just bad media and misinformation. So you can read more about that in some other books. But anyway, that thing on the right, let's look at the top of the head of the figure where the right, the red lines are. The top of the head lines up, the shoulders line up, the top of the butt lines up, the bottom of the butt, the, the hands line up, everything about it lines up. By the way, the butt is very important. I want to point that out because uh, Bigfoots have big butts. Bigfoot got back. It's a fact because your butt muscles are the largest muscles in your body and they are used for two things. Number one, they are used for keeping your torso upright over your pelvis. In other words, an upright posture. So bears don't have big butt muscles, right? And they're also used for bipedal walking. That's why gorillas don't have big butts. That's why bears don't have big butts. That's why humans do, because we're keeping our torso upright and we walk around on two legs. Now, considering how massive and large a Sasquatch is, I mean, they, they are big, big animals, like sometimes two and a half, three feet wide and almost that far front, front to back. Imagine the mass of that. Imagine the size of the butt muscles necessary to keep the torso upright over the pelvis. So all these pictures, if it doesn't have a big butt, it's not a big foot, essentially. But anyway, all that stuff lines up very, very well. And if you look in the picture in the upper left, by the way, notice the pointed head. That's that sagittal crest thing I mentioned earlier with that historical newspaper account about the cone-shaped head. Um, Sasquatches, like all ape species that get big enough, can develop a sagittal crest. It's that, it's that crest in the middle of the skull. And what that is for is anchoring chewing muscles on. When Sasquatches or gorillas or Australopithecines, for example, human ancestors, when they got into the habit of eating very fibrous foods, um, they needed more and more chewing muscles. And your chewing muscles have to attach to your skull. And eventually you need more chewing muscles in your skull can accommodate for. So evolution very eventually brings about a sagittal crest to increase the surface area on your skull for chewing muscles and also zygomatic arches and some other features of your skull. And so basically we see that here. Um, we can see that same feature in large orangutans. We can see it in the largest of male chimps and also uh, gorillas as well, and presumably Sasquatches. It makes perfect anatomical sense. Here's another picture taken in 2017 in Pennsylvania. Don't worry about it. It's in there somewhere. Let's zoom in on it and take a look. There it is. It's real pixelated. I'll go back one. It's kind of in that open area in the forest, uh, right in this area. Um, a boat cruise saw this. 17 people saw this thing. One person had the wherewithal to take out um, his cell phone and snap a picture. I actually snapped two, but one of them, you can't see the animal at all. In this case, it walked into the clearing, and this is what you get. Again, blobby, but something's there. It was moving. Um, somebody else managed to grab a video, but they never got the figure on film, um, on camera, at least I should say, because it's a video, it's not film. But they never got the, the figure on film, but you can hear the people reacting to what they're observing. They're saying things like, man, it must be hot in that suit, because it was like 80, 80 something degrees that day. Oh my gosh, is that a Bigfoot? No, that Bigfoot. And they laugh. No, Bigfoot's not real, but they're all watching something that looks like a Bigfoot. What's he doing? And get closer. Uh, and then people say, I want to leave. They're getting scared. Very interesting to hear that conversation going on. But this is the only picture we got of it. So let's do what I mentioned before. Let's compare it to the Patterson Gimlin film. And again, it's pretty impressive, don't you think? Um, and again, look at the butt. I, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want you guys to all think I'm a butt man of some sort, but look at the butt. It's it's right there. The anatomy is right there, and it is congruent with everything that we think we know about Sasquatches at this point. Not proof but I do take that as evidence. And of course, there she is, the Sasquatch walking across the, the, the sandbar from 1967, October, October 20th. We're almost at the anniversary, by the way. Um, 
so there she is. That has never been proven false. The anatomy is there. You can see her shoulder blades moving underneath the skin. You can see her muscles flexing. Um, you, there's, there's breasts on it, which is a very peculiar thing to put on a suit if it's fake. Um, very impressive film. There are numerous books written about it. I'm not going to go too into it, but another strong piece of evidence. Here's another piece of footage from the Blue Mountains. Not quite as impressive, but it's there. Kind of a strange loping gait. This is by Paul Freeman. It's actually 1992. I can see I put copyright 1994 there. That's a mistake on my part. Here's another piece of footage taken on a thermal imager. Thermal imagers don't see light. They see heat. Um, and in this case, um, the person who filmed it had it set so the hotter it was, it was a black color, not a white color. So, um, and everything else is kind of blown out, I guess, if you want to call it that, because uh, it had rained earlier. So everything was kind of the same temperature, except for this large bipedal thing that was following them, walking between two trees. Let's see if I can get that going again. Here it is. They heard it following them. They heard knocks and other indications that something was there. Um, they heard brush breaking and all that stuff. And he happened to have the camera pointed at the right place. It was like midnight or two in the morning um, at, down in Florida. What always stri strikes me about this is that the arm and leg proportions are not, whoops, um, are not what you would expect of a, of a human, okay? But also look at the hands. The hands are pretty big, which reminds me of that native photograph that we saw from 1914 earlier with the big hands and whatnot on it. Very interesting. I'll let that cycle through the last few and we'll go to the next one. And also the head position, real, real low on those high shoulders. Very cool. Now, here's some footprints. Um, I find the footprints probably be the strongest body of evidence for Sasquatches if you had to look at one facet only. Because really the strongest bit of evidence about Sasquatch is how all these things kind of fit together. But the footprints are so impressive. Um, we, here's three footprints from left to right. It's 1963, 1970, and then 1982. And what we have here, the, uh, this is obviously the most clear representation of it. Um, police officers took this, by the way, um, in 1982 in Grays Harbor County, Washington. Um, a lot of interesting features on this, including this crack. You notice the crack going down the middle of it. Where's my cursor? There it is. This crack going down the middle of the foot is interesting because that is indication of a, of a, a soft fat pad on the plantar surface of the foot, the, the part of the surface of the foot that touches the ground. As the fat pad presses into the ground, it expands to the side and then pulls apart the substrate underneath the footprint, um, just like it would in your footprint on the beach. And that's what this is for, from, I should say. But also I wanna point out a couple other things. Um, the, these bumps on the outside of the foot, they correspond to where bones end and bones start in the foot. Um, the phalanges go to about here and then the metatarsals are after that. And sure enough, look over here, look really closely in this 1963 sample, you can see that same feature. You can see the same feature between the phalanges and the metatarsals. But anyway, the congruence with the footprints are very, very interesting. Um, and by using really nice, clear photo, uh, nice, clear footprints and casts, we can actually get some mark demarcations of where bones are in the foot, like the bumps I just showed you. And a couple anthropologists have taken a stab at this. First, Dr. Grover Krantz on the left from um, Washington State University. He used footprints um, on the left there from an, an animal that was cast in the uh, animal's footprints that were cast in Bossburg, Washington back in 1969. This particular animal, oh, sorry, wrong way. This particular animal had two bumps on the outside of the foot that were different. The bumps we just spoke about would uh, correspond to where these bones were. But in this case, there were two large protrusions and the foot was twisted around a bit. He kind of reasoned, well, there's only three big bones on the outside of the foot. So if there's two protrusions there, that must be where the spaces between the bones are. And he kind of started filling it in like a, like a puzzle essentially. And what he found um, was later built upon by this gentleman over to the right. Dr. Jeff Meldrum from Idaho State University. Um, we've, ended up, we've ended up being good friends over the years. I have a pleasure of speaking with him even just this past weekend, actually two days ago. But Dr. Krantz, I'm sorry, Dr. Jeff Meldrum on the right is literally a PhD in anatomy with a specialization in feet 
and, and what led to bipedalism. So he is extraordinarily well equipped to analyze Sasquatch or any footprints footprint evidence. So he's taken what Krantz has done and kind of finessed it a bit to, with his understanding. And basically over here on the right, you see two feet, uh, two foot reconstructions, I suppose, or reconstructions of feet. On the left is the Sasquatch foot. And on the right is a human foot. And if, if the human foot was grown to the same length, already there's some differences. Sasquatches would have a much wider foot. That's what we would expect from such a large animal, um, a much more surface area to support that weight, et cetera. But there's also small little differences that would be harder to notice. First of all, the ankle bone is moved forward on the foot as compared to the human. This is the Sasquatch here, and this is the human. The ankle bone is moved forward. And what that does, it, that functionally elongates the heel bone. And that's very important because the way you walk is basically your calf muscles are attached to your heel and with tendons and ligaments. And then the calf muscles pull up on your heel and that kind of lifts your heel off the ground and, it, and, and kind of like a wheelbarrow in some ways. And that pushes, that pushes you forward when you walk. In fact, your foot is a lot like a wheelbarrow. A wheelbarrow is what's called a type two lever. Um, and you know, imagine putting a bunch of stuff in a wheelbarrow, right? Um, and it's, you lift it up and, oh, it's heavy, but I put a bunch more stuff in the wheelbarrow right afterwards. I, I guess I could lift it up again and be even heavier, but one of the easiest ways to deal with the increased weight would be if you didn't want to work as hard would be to eat, to elongate, to lengthen the, the wheelbarrow handles, right? You can imagine, oh, if, I, if, I, if the handles were 10 feet long, it would actually be easier to lift, you would have to lift them further. The same amount of work would be conserved, but it would be easier. It would take less force to lift. And that's what the elongation of the heel in the Sasquatch foot does. By elongating that heel, it means that the calf muscles, even though they're bigger because they're in a big animal like a Sasquatch, even though they're bigger, they have to do less work to lift the weight of the animal and walk bipedally. That was discovered by Dr. Jeff Meldrum. And another consequence of that elongation of the heel, or really moving the ankle bone forward, is the metatarsals, which are the bones behind the toes, is these guys here. The metatarsals are also shortened in relation to the foot. As you can see, these are shorter than these over here. And that is another necessary biomechanical redesign of a human-like foot to carry a mass of their size. Now, how do we know where the metatarsals are? Well, based on footprints. Okay, Sasquatch, um, what, what, what we've now discovered is that Sasquatches do not have an arch in their foot. They, well, let me start with us. We have an arch. Um, it is held stiff by tendons and ligaments, and we cannot bend our foot there, even though, as you can see, they're, 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 we should be able to here. I'm gonna get my cursor. Yeah, we should be able to bend our foot here because all these bones have, you know, they're not solid bones, there's joints between them, but we can't do it because our foot is held stiff by this, by these tendons. But Sasquatches, it appears, have flexibility in the mid part of their foot. So when we walk, we push off with our toes and then the very front parts, the heads of the metatarsals. That's where we push off. That's where the force is upon stepping off. But in Sasquatches and every other ape species, including most human ancestors, they could bend their foot just a little right here. So the entire forepart of the foot remains in contact with the ground until it pushes off. And when they push off, it raises a mound of dirt right behind where the metatarsals are. We can see this in chimpanzee footprints. We can see this in uh, gorilla footprints. We can see these in Australopithecus afarensis footprints, the famous Laetoli footprint um, from Africa, from Tanzania. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We can see these same signatures of the foot anatomy. Um, and this picture that I'm circling right now is from the Patterson Gimlin film. And there it is, right behind where the metatarsals are. And remember, Dr. Meldrum figured out the metatarsals are shorter and they're pushed forward on the foot. This is what he bases that on. And sure enough, Dr. Meldrum published that in, I think, 1998 or 1999. Before that, us Bigfooters, we didn't know about that. We're just nerds, right? But he's an academic. Turns out, here's the footprint, the very, very first one 
from 1958, the very first Sasquatch footprint cast that is still in existence. And it has that same feature. Um, you can see it on the bottom here. And then of course, this top cast is a cast of this footprint that I have a photograph in the ground of right here. But you can see the same feature in both. Now, as far as evidence goes, okay, well, this is this is primate anatomy. This is primate foot anatomy is what we're looking at here. Um, a piece of evidence could be, do we find this everywhere? Do we find this in all the Sasquatch footprints? No, not all, because the shape the shape of the footprint is not the shape of the foot. It's the shape of the foot damage under the ground. But we find it in a whole lot. Check these out, okay? Um, there's a cast on the left, and there's a footprint reconstruction on the right. Here is that mound of dirt. Actually, this is a cast of that same photograph I just showed you. And if we go right across, look where that mound of dirt um, appears, right behind the metatarsals, because the foot flexes here, and then pushes the mound of dirt up, it should be right behind the metatarsals. Here's another one. There's the metatarsals, there's the ridge right here. Here's one from 2012. There's the fore part of the foot, here's that raised mound of dirt, and where is it? Right behind the metatarsals. Not in a place that a human would leave, by the way. A, a human would leave a uh, raised mound of dirt up here, Remember, because we push off on our toes and the heads of the metatarsals, but lo and behold, here it is at the base of the metatarsals in a very inhuman-like spot. There's another one. This is from Montana in 2011, right there. If I line up the toes, right there behind the metatarsals. And of course, talking about footprints, Sasquatches must be very rare animals. And what we're finding is that we're finding the same individuals in the same areas. Even though these casts were made by different people at different times, I think we can all kind of see that these are the same animal, even though it's a, a year or so apart. This is two years apart, essentially. Same animal, same area. It makes sense if we're dealing with a very rare animal who uh, haunts a particular territory. Sasquatches, since they don't have um, that arch that we were talking about, their feet are very, very malleable. They're almost as bendy, in fact, as your hands are. And look at this. We believe at this point, these are all the same animals, the same individual Sasquatch. And look at the variation in toe positions. And actually, I have an entire one-hour presentation on nothing but the Sasquatch foot and the various types of uh, prints it could leave. So I won't get into that too deeply. And of course, when you look closely at some of these uh, footprints and even handprint casts, you can find dermatoglyphics, skin detail, in other words. Primates are the only things that have uh, skin detail, dermatoglyphics, you know, fingerprints essentially, but you know, they're on the bottom of the feet too. I don't know if you knew that. You have uh, those sort of prints on the bottom of your feet. We can't call those footprints though, because footprints mean something else, but you get the idea. There's other body parts. There's some hands. Um, there's this a hand in 1994. There's another hand from 1986, I believe. Here's just a couple knuckles and possibly a thumb right there, pushing into the ground. Here's a, a knuckle print with a thumb going off to the side. You can even see the thumbnail right there if you look closely. Yes, this is a butt print. As I said, Bigfoot got back. Um, and actually, this butt print, we can laugh about it because it is funny. You know, everybody likes a good butt joke, I guess. But you can see the hair striations on it. And the hair flow pattern matches that of all other apes, including us, because that's our biological family. Depending on how hairy your butt is, your hair flows in the same direction as the hair that can be seen on this cast. And down here, this brown thing is actually where a Sasquatch uh, laid in the mud. It's called the Skookum cast. We have a, um, a big uh, butt print here and part of a leg. And these impressions here are actually the heel um, hitting the ground several times. There's an arm. It's a very, very interesting cast. You'd have to read about it called the Skookum cast. Um, I mentioned congruency, and just from a biological sort of perspective, um, an interesting experiment would be, you know, like Sasquatches and where they live and what they need to live, et cetera. Sasquatches are large omnivores. They've been seen eating meat and plants. They're omnivorous. Well, if we look at um, another large omnivore that lives here in the United States, we probably want to look at black bear. And so on the left here, I have a, I have a, I just, I found a, found one from California where black bears live in California. 
Um, this, I believe this is from the Department of Fish and Wildlife or whatever they call themselves down there. Um, and inside this red line is where black bears are known to live in California. And over on the right here, this is a Google map layer of reported Sasquatch observations. And you can see there's a high degree of congruence between the two. Because in, in my mind, Sasquatches and bears require the same you know, uh, resources, essentially. But if you're a skeptic, and I approve of skepticism, I really do. There's so much garbage on YouTube and television and everywhere else. You really need to be skeptical when it comes to Bigfoot stuff. But the hardcore skeptics who throw all this away have to say that the people who live in mountains are more prone to lying than the people who live in desert regions. What else can you say about it? Now, why do I do this? Well, I'm obviously an eccentric individual, kind of weird. I always have been. Um, but really, Sasquatches, I, I know Sasquatches are real animals because we're only, you know, this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, there's so much more evidence. And you can go into any one of these pieces of evidence as deeply as you would like to um, and never get to the bottom. I know they are real. But again, I said earlier that proof is going to come in the form of a bullet or at least a dead one on a slab. My effort is to educate the public so these things are not treated as monsters, as the gorillas were for 100 years after their discovery. My mother, born in 1941, um, grew up with the black and white sort of, uh, you know, universal horror stuff, Frankenstein and, you know, Wolfman and all that stuff. And who was a bad guy in those movies and a lot of times and uh, other movies like it? Gorillas. Um, so I think that if we can avert a, a tragedy, I think, by educating ourselves and the public about Sasquatches so they are treated appropriately after discovery. I'm essentially softening the blow of discovery. Um, and, you know, I do make my living off it, but only because I, I want, you know, I enjoy it and all that sort of stuff. Here at the North American Bigfoot Center, it's an educational facility. I encourage all of you to come by and say hello. Um, I, I, we have a lot of this um, evidence and a lot more on display. So again, we're trying to do some good here um, by not hoaxing, by not lying about things, by uh, giving you the evidence as it is, by not saying that they're paranormal or anything like that. Perfectly normal animals waiting to be discovered. Discovery is coming. What can we do about it now? We can educate the public and we can protect public land on which Sasquatches live. Other than that, I mean, I guess I'm just a weirdo who likes Bigfoot stuff. If you need me for any reason, you can reach me at any of these places. Um, and I want to thank you very, very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Hello, Cliff. Thank Hello. you so much. Um, you have a very comprehensive website, cliffbarrickman.com, with a lot of audio files and image files um, that are really interesting. Is there any that stand out to you uh, that's on the website that people can look at? On um, my website, well, uh, there, there, I have some favorites, you know, for various reasons. Um, I, I think that one of them is the the, um, the Siskiyou Whistle Knock. I think that one's really cool. It may not be that compelling, but I was there, you know, so it, it was a little bit different to me. Um, I was there in 2.30 in the morning or whenever that was in the dark with one other person with something knocking, bam, and then whistling afterwards. Um, very, very peculiar behavior if Bigfoots aren't real, right? Um, there are a couple others stand out. One of the, the Horse Creek Howl, um, we actually recorded that while filming Finding Bigfoot. Um, that was my record. That was the early days where the production was trying to figure out this Bigfoot thing and who are these weirdos that we're out with. And that's what they were thinking at the time. So I had to say they weren't doing their job. So I, re I recorded that with my own recorder. Um, while, while some production stuff was down actually almost at the time. So there's a couple of them that stand out, but for me, it's about the experiences that I was having at the time. I think that that to me makes them stand out. So, you know, it's kind of like, if you look at a, if you look at a, a photo album, you remember the memories that were there. And that's what my website is to me is a photo album where I happen to get evidence out of it too. Yeah, I encourage everyone to check them out. There's some really interesting stuff. And you've talked about habitat um, in the Redwoods, British Columbia, you know, off of Highway 26. These are all pretty rainy places. And then this New Mexico photo that was in a, I've been there in the Farmington Farmville area. It's very dry. And what does this tell us about the adaptability of Sasquatch? Well, I think it, uh, it, 
the Sasquatches are obviously very adaptable, but you know, the, the more rain there is, the more sighting there, sightings there are. Um, a guy named John Green, who first started uh, collecting sighting reports and publishing them a long time ago, noticed that correlation. And in some places, um, like uh, New Mexico, for example, sure snows a lot there and snow counts as precipitation. So um, in New Mexico, those mountain sort of islands that they have amidst the desert and stuff, those very often have Sasquatches located in them as well. Um, they are, you picture a Sasquatch is, you know, live livelihood is essentially hiding and eating. Um, so the more plants there are, the better off they're going to be. So the more rain there is, the more plants and whatnot are going to be there as well. Um, but Sasquatches are certainly adaptable. And I think that kind of speaks to their intelligence level. Now they're not using math or, you know, using fire or watching the golden girls or something like that. Although that's arguable about the uh, ten, uh, intelligence thing, but you know, but you get what I'm saying. They don't have that level of culture. They have the culture much more like the other ape species. Um, uh, but they are strategic. They are very good at what they do. They've been selected through evolution to be very good at, say, ambush predators like work, you know, they, they, uh, they, uh, they've been heard um, and actually seen working together to kind of funnel deer through a choke points um, to try to get deer. They, they, so they are strategic thinkers and very smart and very, very adaptable. But then again, so are black bears. Black bears don't hunt cooperatively like Sasquatches do, but they are also very adaptable to their environment. So... Yeah, you're right. Yeah, black bears are also, they live in New Mexico and, and I was in the Steens a couple of weeks ago and they're in, they're there too. And nice. On the east side. Um, and I, yeah, I encourage everyone to check out the North American Bigfoot Center and look at the resources at cliffbearpman.com. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk to us, Cliff, and share uh, all of your knowledge and Thank you in the audience and viewers for joining us. Please check out more free programs to shootslibrary.org forward slash calendar to check out events or go to our YouTube channel to see recordings. Thank you. Thank you.